how dangerous can one person's ego get? I ask this question tonight because the world is paying the price for one man's ego, one man's stubbornness and denial is putting the entire world at risk once again. I am talking about the Chinese President Xi Jinping and his stubbornness, which could once again bring the world to its knees. At a time when Wuhan virus cases are on the rise in China, ICUs in the country are full, China is scrapping quarantine for international travellers. Chinese citizens are planning vacations abroad. Exactly what explains Xi Jinping's decision at this time especially? Has the COVID dragon gone berserk? Will Xi Jinping infect the world again? That is our top focus tonight. Also on the show for you, a brain-eating amoeba has claimed its first victim. South Korea reporting the first deaths, sending alarm bells ringing around the world. We get you a detailed report. Taiwan has extended its mandatory military service over the Chinese threat following China's rehearsal of a Taiwan takeover. Will a small mistake resume the Korean War? As tensions flare up in the Korean Peninsula, South Korea sends drones into North Korean airspace in an unprecedented move. We tell you what's brewing. The U.S. is witnessing the impact of a once-in-a-lifetime blizzard. We get you a Gravitas special report. Our lead focus tonight is Xi Jinping's China. Has the COVID dragon gone berserk? As evidence continues to pile up of the deadly virus spreading havoc across China's population and hammering its economy, with the pandemic still raging, we learn that instead of trying to cage the Wuhan virus, Beijing is intent on reopening its doors to the world. Why? This seems irrational and even inconceivable, but there has to be a reason. Is it Xi Jinping's obstinacy or a dictator's arrogance, which is putting the world at risk again? What kind of risk? Well, the risk of another international Wuhan virus horror. Cases are still rising in China. Remember, hospitals are overwhelmed. And guess what? Xi Jinping is opening the gates of the dragon's den at a time when the world is witnessing a new Omicron variant, is already circulating there. Starting the 8th of January, in fact, Chinese citizens will be able to travel abroad. They will be allowed to go on vacations to any country of their choice. It could be your country, it could be mine. This is not the fault of the Chinese people. It is a decision made by an authoritarian government which wants to suspend belief in reality. It wants us to believe that conditions in China are normal. But what does that mean for the world, for you and me? It means, in simple language, the return of risk to our lives and to the lives of our loved ones. Only one man takes decisions in China, Xi Jinping. The combination of dictatorship and denial can be deadly. Let me ask you this. Why would he open China's borders now? He kept the borders shut for three years. But now, when the virus has resurged, he is flinging open the gates. Today, the number of infections in China is so high that Beijing has started censoring the truth of the real numbers. The harsh reality of China is such that the people are buying life-saving Indian drugs from the black market. Look at this headline. Is the Chinese dictator blind to this truth? Or is his ego more important to him than his people's and the world's health and their lives? How many must die to shield one dictator's ego? Researchers say Xi Jinping can take action to reduce the number of deaths in China. He can slow down the spread of this virus. 
But for that, he will have to do the obvious, which is to ramp up vaccination in his country. He will have to ensure that there is adequate supply of medicines in China. But first, Xi Jinping will have to acknowledge the disaster in the dragon's den. And here's the problem. Acknowledging the virus resurgence hurts his reputation and his claims that he had achieved zero COVID. Instead, he is downgrading the COVID measures from category A to B. He is incentivizing travel. We heard last night that from the 8th of January, people coming into China will not have to quarantine. What followed was a surge in Chinese searches for foreign travel. Those going out will be free to pick any country they like. Some countries were found to be especially popular among Chinese tourists, like Japan, Thailand, South Korea, the US, Singapore, Malaysia, Australia. Clearing these flights for landing will be nothing short of rolling out the red carpet for the Wuhan virus. And just to repeat, it's not the people of China I'm pointing a finger at, not at all. It is the Chinese government's deliberate maleficence at a time when funeral companies have become China's fastest growing industry. Do you know such is the state of China today that shares of funeral companies are surging? Fu Shu Yuan International Group is one such company. Its stock price was recently soaring at a record height. It is China's biggest cemetery operator, also funeral service provider, and now that the demand for funeral services has surged, the stock prices of these companies have surged as well. It's a grim story. But then, what is the rest of the world doing about this? As Xi Jinping prepares for a fresh export of the Wuhan virus, Japan is tightening its border controls for travelers from China. It will be testing every passenger for the virus. The number of flights coming in from China being curtailed. But are these measures enough? If you ask me, the onus is on the Japanese media to pressure the government to do more. For some, however, the short-term economic benefits of Chinese tourism outweigh the dangers. This Japan Times article, for example, says before the pandemic, Japan's tourism sector was reliant on foreign travelers, especially those from China, Tourists from China often went on shopping sprees in Japan, dubbed explosive shopping in Japanese, with their spending amounting to 36.8% of the 1.77 trillion that came from all tourists in 2019. But no one ever gained from being short-sighted. Is Japan ready to pick the health bill from a further spurt in the Wuhan virus infections when it is already under severe pressure? Some health experts in Hong Kong are already spooked. They are saying that the city must prepare to handle a spike in Wuhan virus cases. But dictators could not care less. They do not have to worry about elections and public opinion. This is a dragon that likes to play with fire. And this is not the only story making news from China. This is John Mufat Fugui. He was the ambassador of Solomon Islands to China. Solomon Islands is a country that Xi Jinping likes to cozy up to. It's located in the Pacific and China wants to set up a base there, expand its reach. Beijing has already promised some $730 million in financial aid. All of this. And guess what? This Solomon Island envoy has died mysteriously in Beijing. The reasons for the deaths, unknown. And this is not a one-off incident. In February 2021, Ukraine's envoy died. In September last year, a former foreign policy advisor to the then German Chancellor Angela Merkel died in China. In April 2021, it was a Philippine diplomat. Fugui was the fifth envoy to die mysteriously. Fifth. And then... There is the report of the missing VIP. Zhao Liji was number three in China's all-powerful Politburo. Zhao has not been seen in public for a while now. He recently also missed an important high-level conference. And no one knows what has happened to him.
Did the virus get to him? Or did Xi Jinping? And as the world is still trying to recover from the Wuhan virus, if you think the worst is behind us, I have some bad news for you. Another deadly microorganism has been found, and this time it's an amoeba called Negrea foleri, or to put it simply, the brain-eating amoeba. What does it do? It doesn't only target your immune system or lungs, it can attack your brain. Hence the name, brain-eating amoeba. And this amoeba has sent alarm bells ringing around the world after claiming its first victim. The Korea Disease Control and Prevention Agency, or the KDCA, has confirmed the deadly microorganism has killed a South Korean national in his 50s. The man had returned from Thailand on the 10th of December. And the very next day, he was hauled to a hospital. He showed early symptoms of meningitis. He suffered from headaches, fever, vomiting, slurred speech. The doctors conducted several tests, and what they found was terrifying. The man's body contained a gene that was 99.6% identical to that of a meningitis patient. You see, in meningitis, the protective membranes around the brain and spinal cord get infected. It can lead to seizures and permanent brain damage. And if it is not treated pro promptly, it can lead to death. And that has wa is, what, is what has happened with the South Korean national. He died 10 days after being admitted. Meningitis can be caused by a host of virus and bacteria, but for this man, it was caused by the brain-eating amoeba. Let's understand this deadly pathogen. Nagleria florei is a free-living amoeba. It is commonly found in soil and for warm fresh water like lakes, rivers and hot springs. It can enter your body when you go swimming or diving and ingest contaminated water through your nose. It's a common assumption that fresh water bodies are free of harmful bacteria, but that is not always true. So you might want to think before diving headfirst into a river. Not just that, you can also get infected if you clean your nose with contaminated water. Now, we don't mean to scare you, but people have been infected from recreational waters as well. That was when the pools were not adequately chlorinated. Now imagine going to a water park and coming back with a deadly infection. Who would have thought? And what happens once it enters your body? The amoeba directly aims for your brain. It destroys the brain tissues and causes meningitis. The symptoms can typically be observed within five days of infection. But it has an incubation period ranging from 1 to 12 days. And the most concerning part is the infection is almost always fatal. It has a death rate of 97%. But thankfully, it is a rare disease. As of 2018, over 380 cases have been reported across the world. This includes the US, China, Thailand, Japan and India. So far, America has reported the highest number of cases. 154 U.S. citizens have been infected since the 1960s, out of which only four have survived. Now, South Korea has reported its first ever death from the brain-eating amoeba, and the way it has happened may remind you of the COVID-19 pandemic. A person goes overseas and gets infected. He returns to his country, gets admitted and dies. Now, again, we don't aim to incite fear, but it is inevitable to draw parallels in a post-pandemic world. In the recent years, we have realized that small microorganisms can bring the, an entire world to a halt. It can cause millions of deaths and topple economies. And with new variants being discovered so frequently, it's only natural to be wary of infections like this one, especially when it has such a high death rate. KDCA says the odds of human-to-human -human transmission of the amoeba are low, but it has still asked the local residents to take precautions. This is what the KDCA head, Ji Young Mi, has said in a press release. I'm quoting. To prevent the infection, 
We recommend avoiding swimming and leisure-related activities and using clean water when traveling to areas where cases have been reported. The risk of infection is not high, but most cases start through swimming, so it's best to be cautious. The infections are likely to occur in sub summer months as the amoeba thrives in higher temperatures. Cases are commonly reported among males under 14 years. The precise reasons for that are not known, but it could be because children of that age are more likely to indulge in water activities. Unlike COVID-19 cases that start skyrocketing in the winter months, we are relatively safe from the brain-eating amoeba at this point in time. But who knows if a new variant is detected in the near future. If the KDCA has urged the residents to take precautions, it might know something that others do not. So it's best to be safe. The world cannot afford to witness another global disease disaster. European values. That is an oxymoron today. In fact, it has been for years now. The phrase is used by the Brussels kleptocracy when they take a moral high ground, you know, to preach or lecture other countries on ethics, principles, standards. They just love doing that, don't they? Today, the European Union cannot even afford to preach values. The bloc for decades is believed to have set the standards of democracy, transparency, accountability. But tonight, we are calling it out for its hypocrisy. Suitcases loaded with cash have been found. Phones and computers have been seized. Senior European politicians detained. We have told you about the great European heist, which is the biggest corruption scandal to hit the European Union in 25 years. With fresh details emerging, what we can tell you is that this cash for favor scandal has completely shaken the roots of the European Union. Several European leaders systematically took bribes from gas-rich gas Islamic states in the Persian Gulf. Why? To whitewash these countries' dire human rights record. And the damage is of cosmic proportions. At the center of this scandal is Eva Kaili, 44-year-old serving member of the European Parliament and former Greek Socialist Vice President of the European Parliament. Investigative agencies found 150,000 euros in cash from her flat, which the prosecutors believe came from Qatar and Morocco. Her partner is also in custody. He has been accused of money laundering and creating a criminal organization. He has even confessed to a role in the bribery network. Giorgio has been a parliamentary assistant to two Italian MEPs. Kylie has been denying all charges. Kylie's father was also caught with 600,000 euros in cash. While the spotlight may be on Kylie, she may not be the key figure in this scandal. For that, we need to move to Rome from Brussels. Pierre Antonio Panzeri, this is where the spotlight should be, in fact. He is a 67-year-old former Italian member of the European Parliament, and he is now charged with corruption and is in custody. Earlier this month, Belgium's intelligence service broke into his house in Brussels. They found an unbelievable amount of cash, 700,000 euros. Most of it in crisp new 50-euro notes. 17,000 euros also seized from his home in Italy. His wife and his daughter also in custody, accused of being his accomplices. In 2019, Panzeri had also set up a human rights charity in Brussels. The irony is not lost on us. The board of this charity was stuffed with the great and good. Bernard Cazeneau, former French Prime Minister, Emma Bonino, former European Commissioner, Federica Mogherini, former EU foreign policy chief. It's important to note here that none of them are accused of any wrongdoing, but both Kazinov and Mogherini resigned after Panzeri was arrested. Now, there is no doubt that Panzeri had big names of Italian politics by his side. Investigators say Panzeri used this NGO as a vehicle for Qatar to influence the European Parliament. 
So far, five people are in custody, all except one of them Italian. They are all accused of corruption, money laundering and criminal association. Many more are under investigation. So far, only one member of the European Parliament has been arrested, Eva Kaili. But how many MEPs are thought to be involved? More than 60. So why have there been no arrests, no more arrests? Well, that's because MEPs enjoy immunity from prosecution unless they are caught red-handed. So prosecutors are powerless unless the parliament votes to lift immunity in each case. Others who are accused of taking bribes are former MEPs, their assistances, heads of human rights charities, trade unions, and most are Italians, including members and former members of Partito Democratico, Italy's post-communist party. Reports on the investigations even say some of them have already confessed. The scandal has put the Partito Democratico or the PD in the dock. Even Italian media, even though by and large left-wing, has been unable to avoid uncomfortable questions since the scandal emerged. Former leaders of the PD saying it's a spit in the face for the left. For Italy and for the European Union, popular support for the party, which was devastated by a resounding defeat at the general elections, has dipped further. Some Belgian prosecutors are even calling the scandal the Italian job. But inside Italy, the media is silent. According to a poll released, 58% of Italians think what has emerged so far is just the tip of the iceberg of a system that is deeply corrupt. And we could not agree more. The stench of this scandal has traveled deep inside Italian political corridors. Will the bubble soon burst for other European members as well? Irrespective of the right or the left wing politicians being involved, what is clear is that European leaders have not just betrayed their parties, but also their core beliefs. The voters who elect them and their countries the scandal has left the European Union to be a swamp of corruption and hypocrisy. What we can tell you right now is that this certainly is not the end of the scandal. There are more details coming out and it gets murkier each day. But for now, there are more questions than answers about this great European heist. And from a scandal in Europe, we turn to a scandal in Pakistan. A scandal surrounding the PCB, the Pakistan Cricket Board, the central governing body for cricket in the country. It seems the country's political divisions have spilled over to this body. And here's why I say this. Last week, this body's chairman was sacked. Some of you might know him. His name is Ramiz Raja, an articulate voice of cricket the world over. One of the best TV commentators in the business, both on and off the field. He has created a benchmark for himself with his unique style and gift of the gap. But today, he is a man out of favor, someone who has lost the approval of his peers. And why is that? Apparently, because of Pakistan's abysmal performance under his watch. PCB officials say Raja was sacked due to the Pakistani team's consecutive losses, the last one being the humiliating whitewash against England. This is their version, but Ramiz Raja does not agree. He says he has been made a political scapegoat, that he is the victim of political vendetta. And vendetta by whom, you ask? The government, he says. Now, he hasn't taken any names, but observers say his charge was aimed at Shehbaz Sharif, the Prime Minister of Pakistan, the patron-in-chief of the PCB. You have to listen to this. जहां तक दूसरा आपका अमल दखल है सियासत का क्रिकेट बोर्ड में बिल्कुल नहीं होना चाहिए था ये ये जो गेम है ना ये क्रिकेटर्स की है ये क्रिकेटर्स को की का ये प्लेइंग फील्ड है यहां पे बाहर से लोग आके जब हमला करते हैं और समझते हैं जी कि आप जो काम कर रहे हैं वो ठीक नहीं और फिर मैं तो यही कहूंगा कि एक बंदे को लाने के लिए नजम सेठी को आपको पूरी आपने कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन बदल दी
You heard that. There is no space for politics in cricket, he says. And we agree. But not too long ago, Ramiz Raja was facing the same charge. He was being accused of running an autocratic regime within the body. A regime that functioned with the blessings of Pakistan's former Prime Minister Imran Khan. You see, Raja was an Imran Khan appointee. In September last year, he was appointed the PCB chairman by Captain Khan himself. And since then, he was often accused of running the body like a psychophant. He was accused of making appointments at whim and alienating people in Pakistan's cricket ecosystem. Not just that, he also shared a frosty relationship with the Pakistani media due to his combative nature. So naturally, when the regime changed, Ramiz Raja's exit seemed imminent. You see, the office of the Prime Minister in Pakistan has always had massive influence on cricket. Historically, every regime change has brought changes to the cricket board. Ramiz Raja's case is no different. He was close to the former Prime Minister Imran Khan. The current Prime Minister, Shehbaz Sharif, does not really like him. Ramiz Raja tried to bridge the gap. A few months after Shehbaz Sharif became the country's Prime Minister, he said he was no longer in touch with Imran Khan. And this was seen as an attempt by him to stay in office. Unfortunately, these attempts have failed. This man is Najam Sethi. He has been named as the interim chairman of the PCB. He now leads a new 14-member committee in charge of the body. Immediately after he was appointed, he put out this tweet. It said, and I'm quoting, The cricket regime headed by Ramiz Raja is no more. The 2014 PCB constitution stands restored. The management committee will work tirelessly to revive first-class cricket. Thousands of cricketers will be employed again. The famine in cricket will come to an end. The famine. And has Ramiz Raja even responded to this? He has. He says the new chief does not know a thing about cricket. That he has never even picked up the bat. So he doubts if he will be able to improve the state of affairs. Listen to this. Ramiz Raja playing field. आप समझे या नहीं तो आपको फिर आपको चुभन और हर्ट होती है इसलिए कि ऐसे लगता है जैसे कोई मसीहा आ गए हैं जो कि क्रिकेट को पता नहीं कहां से कहां ले जाएंगे हालांकि हमें पता है कि इनके मोटिव्स और ये ये सवाल ही पैदा नहीं होता है कि ये क्रिकेट की एडवांसमेंट के लिए डेवलपमेंट के लिए आए हैं ये चौधराट के लिए आए हैं और इनको शौक है कि किसी तरह से इनको लाइमलाइट मिल जाए और ना कोई लेना देना क्रिकेट में ना कभी बैट उठाया है और उठ के और चेयरमैन लगा देते हैं You've got to give it to him. He does know a thing or two about humor, but that's not the point here. The point here is that the state of affairs in Pakistan cricket, it's staring at multiple challenges from its lackluster performance to its tepid pitches to India's refusal to play the Asia Cup on its soil. And at a time like this, the country's cricket board gets mired in politics. And there's no saying where things are headed next. Yesterday, China had a dress rehearsal of the Taiwan invasion. We told you about that. And today, Taiwan seems to be saying that it has known where the drills are headed for a while now. Earlier today, Taiwan extended its mandatory military service from four months to a year. It says the decision is the result of years of evaluation. But the timing of the announcement cannot be missed. Here's a detailed report. Every man in Taiwan must serve in the military for four months. The conscription has been in place since 2013. But now its rules are being changed. From four months, the term of length of compulsory military service is being extended to a year. 
because four months, Taiwan believes, is not good enough at a time when China seems to be rehearsing the takeover of Taiwan. The current four-month compulsory military service system can no longer provide sufficient quantity of troops and quality training to meet the needs of combat readiness under the rapidly changing situation. After two years of complete evaluation and reviews, considering the troop supply needs, we decided to resume one-year compulsory service starting from 2024. There was one such dress rehearsal on the 26th of December. 71 Chinese Air Force jets and drones entered Taiwan's air defense identification zone. It was the largest incursion till date. A day later, Taiwan's president had a special message for the people. As long as Taiwan is strong, it will not turn into a war zone. But to gain that strength, Taiwan must train. Taiwan. Taiwan wants to tell the world that between democracy and dictatorship, we firmly believe in democracy. Between war and peace, we insist on peace. Let us show the courage and determination to protect our homeland and defend democracy. I believe it will bring the victory of freedom of democracy in the world. Starting 2024, Taiwan's compulsory military training will become more intense. There will be shooting exercises for conscripts, also combat instructions, the kind used by American forces. Taiwan will also train conscripts in operating powerful missiles, the likes of Stinger anti-aircraft missiles, even anti-tank missiles. Conscripts will also be tasked with guarding key infrastructure. I have to admit that this is an incredibly difficult decision, but as president and as the commander-in-chief, protecting the national security and ensuring national interest, allowing Taiwan to survive eternally and that people can live a free and democratic life for generations to come is an unavoidable responsibility of mine as the president. There was a time when men had to serve in the army for at least two years. Then, rules were changed to appease the voters. Two years became four months. And now, it's a year again. The timing of it can't be missed. China believes it can use force to get Taiwan to bow down. Taipei disagrees. It wants to match force with force. Strength with strength. Tensions are at their peak in the Korean Peninsula. Pyongyang has had a record year of missile testing. In 2020, North Korea conducted just four missile tests. The number doubled the next year. And this year, North Korea has fired more missiles than any other year. It has fired over 90 cruise and ballistic missiles in 2022 so far. At one point, it even launched 23 missiles in a single day. Its leader, Kim Jong-un, is showing off a range of weapons as world leaders fear a potential nuclear test on the horizon. Now, North Korea's latest provocation has marked a serious escalation in tensions. Five North Korean drones crossed into South Korea on Monday. The North Korean drones were first spotted over the northwestern city of Gimpo, but flew over several other cities, including the capital Seoul. And this prompted Seoul to scramble fighter jets and attack helicopters to try and shoot them down. Despite a five-hour pursuit, the drones reportedly all returned to North Korea. Several commercial flights at two airports were grounded for about 50 minutes at the request of the South Korean military. The incident raises questions about South Korea's air defenses. According to officials, South Korea fired about 100 shots but still failed to bring the drones down. One of its own aircraft involved in the, in the response, a KA-1 light attack aircraft, crashed east of Seoul. At a cabinet meet, the South Korean president faulted the military's readiness and posture, which he said was greatly lacking. The military expressed regret that it failed to shoot down any of the five North Korean drones. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff admitted 
that the country's air defenses were better equipped to detect and strike North Korea's armed drones, which are larger and pose a bigger threat. The South has vowed to boost its air defenses, including establishing a special drone unit. And what followed was unprecedented. A day later, in a tit-for-tat move, Seoul also sent drones across the border into the north. Now, this was a first, and this briefly stopped flights from taking off at major airports near Seoul. The North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, meanwhile, opened a key political meeting, touting North Korea's increased power in quote-unquote all fields, military, economy, politics. It's not clear what North Korea intended to accomplish by sending the drones. Despite international sanctions, Pyongyang has been intensifying its weapons development. Kim Jong-un says he wants his country to have the world's most powerful nuclear force. He even declared the country an irreversible nuclear state this year. Earlier this year, the North Korean leader also warned that his nuclear forces are fully prepared for an actual war. Monday's incursion was the first time in five years that North Korean drones entered the South's airspace. The two Koreas technically still remain at war. In June 1950, 75,000 troops from the Communist North began an incursion across the 38th parallel, the boundary between the North and the South. U.S. troops supporting South Korea joined the war in the following months and North Koreans, supported by China and the then USSR, were pushed back. A bloody stalemate followed and an armistice, armistice was signed in July 1953. Five million troops and civilians lost their lives in the conflict. I repeat, the war ended in a ceasefire, not a peace treaty. South Korea still has the U.S. by its side. And the North continues to enjoy support from China and Russia. The situation continues to remain fragile. It has been a year full of provocations and war rhetoric. Could a small mistake resume the Korean War? And can the world afford another war while one rages in Europe? Shifting focus for now, Apple has been charged $98 million in Japan. And why is that? Over incorrect tax exemptions. The tech giant failed to report bulk purchases from its stores and missed taxing possible foreign resellers. How exactly did that happen? Let me explain this. Foreign visitors in Japan are exempted from 10% consumption tax. Tourists staying for less than six months can buy souvenirs or everyday goods without paying the tax. However, this exemption does not apply to purchases for resale purposes. Any visitor who bulk buys goods and plans to sell them for profit needs to pay the consumption tax. And that is where Apple lagged behind. Foreign shoppers purchased iPhones in bulk at some stores. In fact, one individual bought hundreds of handsets at once. And this clearly indicated that he was a reseller. But Apple missed the point. The tech giant exempted him from tax and paid the price for this later. You see, stores are responsible for paying incorrectly exempted taxes. The seller is obligated to cover all purchases that should have been taxed but slipped through the cracks. And in this case, Apple had to make up for the wrong tax exempts. So who is at fault then? Apple for not monitoring its sales properly or Japan's unique tax-free shopping rules. Now reports say Apple Japan has filed an amended tax return. It halted tax-free shopping in Japan in June and confirmed that the service remains unavailable. $98 million is a hefty amount. Such unusually large back tax charges also highlight a glaring loophole in Japanese regulations. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. Consumables like cosmetics or pharmaceuticals under $3,744 are exempted from tax. But when it comes to general goods like home electronics, there is no such price cap. 
So when bulk purchases from resellers go unnoticed, they can incur huge losses for the seller. And Apple is not alone in this situation. Japan's three big department store chains have also faced a similar fate. They have been charged nearly $750,000 in unpaid consumption taxes. Inbound tourism and consumption are pivotal in Japan's growth strategy. Foreign visitors have a huge appetite for shopping and that is reflected in Japan's economy. But improper exemptions serve as a loss for the government. They cost money, which the country needs to fund social security programs. Unlike Japan, visitors are required to declare purchases when they leave the country. Taxes are refunded to them at that point. No doubt it involves cumbersome paperwork, but it is less likely to result in lost tax revenue. On similar lines, stores in European Union members send the refunds to the shoppers after confirming with customs. In other countries, this process is handled by government agencies. But Japan does not charge tax to begin with. It generates more revenue as foreign shoppers find tax exemptions attractive. But it also raises the odds of incorrect exemptions. Reseller, resellers get away without paying the tax and the sellers are made to pay for it. On the other hand, there is nothing new about a big tech flouting regulations, avoiding tax and stifling competition seems to have become the norm. Were the exemptions Apple's failed attempt to evade taxes? The company already faces a far more significant tax challenge in the EU. According to the European Union, Apple owed some $13.1 million in back taxes to Ireland. It was earlier ruled that Apple had avoided taxation on almost all profits generated in the EU single market. But the decision was overruled and the appeal still remains pending before the European Court of Justice. Shifting focus now to America, the U.S. is bearing the brunt of a once-in-a-lifetime blizzard. With flight disruptions, homes and vehicles buried in snow, a thick snow blanket engulfing several parts, and more snow is expected. Our next report telling you more about the situation on the ground. Vehicles buried in snow. Snow-covered neighborhoods. A thick snow blanket. These are scenes from New York State's Buffalo City that has been bearing the brunt of an intense blizzard. New York's second largest city has witnessed the wrath of what the governor has called an epic once-in-a-lifetime weather disaster. It has dumped more than four feet of snow on Buffalo since Friday. At least 60 lives have been lost in weather-related incidents nationwide including cases of people found in snowbanks, in their cars, or who had died from cardiac events while plowing or blowing snow. Multiple vehicles were seen buried in snow, with motorists struggling to tow them through unplowed streets. With hundreds of motorists trapped, the National Guard troops were called in to help with rescue efforts. About 200 National Guard troops were mobilized in western New York to help police and fire crews, conduct wellness checks and bring supplies to shelters. Drone footage showed stationary trucks and cars forming long queues on ice and snow-covered highways. This is Hoax Lakeshore Restaurant in Hamburg, New York, covered in icicles on Monday. The powerful blizzard paralyzed western New York over the Christmas weekend, burying homes, roads and vehicles in Buffalo under several inches of snow on Monday morning. Emergency workers have had to struggle to navigate past snowdrifts to do their jobs. 
Many snow plows, tow trucks, ambulances, and other emergency vehicles dispatched over the weekend had to be rescued themselves after getting stuck in the snow. The blizzard has been deemed the Buffalo area's worst in 45 years. The Greater Buffalo region lying at the edge of Lake Erie near the Canadian border, was one of the hardest hit places. The storm is the result of heavy winds and lake effect snow. That is the result of moisture picked up by frigid air moving over warmer lake waters. Thousands of flight cancellations and delays coupled with long lines and missing luggage at airports frustrated US travelers over the Christmas weekend. The travel disruptions continued into Monday. The impact was visible at airports across the United States. Travelers waited in long lines to find alternative routes to get to their destination, with the Arctic deep freeze and sprawling storm front extending over most of the country for days. As far south as the Mexican border, while blinding winds that caused whiteout conditions for more than two days had abated by Monday, the snow kept falling, with additional snow of up to a foot forecast through Tuesday in some parts. Bureau Report, we on World is One. Time now to take a quick look at what else made news around the world. Time for Gravitas Global Headlines. Car bomb attack in Afghanistan killed provincial police chief and his two guards. Islamic State Khorasan claims responsibility. The attack happened in the capital of Badakhshan province. Ukrainian president speaks to Indian Prime Minister Modi, seeks India's help as G20 president in implementation of his peace plan. The Prime Minister also conveyed India's support for any peace efforts. Iran reroutes flight bound for Dubai. Football legend Ali Dai says his wife and daughter on board have been deported and prevented from leaving the country. Dai has voiced support for anti-government protests in Iran. Meanwhile, President Ibrahim Raisi said Iran would show no mercy towards hostile opponents of the Islamic Republic, gripped by over a hundred days of protests sparked by Masa Amini's death. Syrian Kurdish-led forces boost security a day after foiling a deadly Islamic State group assault on a prison, fearing that the extremists will strike again. Tensions have flared up on the Serbia-Kosovo border. Serbian president has now ordered the country's troops in the region on full combat readiness, ignoring NATO's call for maintaining peace and calm. Double whammy for Britain's cost of living crisis, soaring inflation and stagnant wages. A PricewaterhouseCooper report says wages next year will be at 2006 levels, taking inflation into account. Heavy downpour triggers floods in Jordan's iconic city of Petra. Tourists evacuated as waters from surrounding mountains pour into the World Heritage Site. Australia opener marked the occasion of his 100th test more special with an unbeaten double ton against South Africa at the Melbourne Cricket Ground. The 36-year-old became only the second player to achieve this feat as Australia ended day two of the test on 386 for three. Arsenal came from a goal behind to beat West Ham United 3-1 in the English Premier League. Second half goals from Bukayo Saka, Gabriel Martinelli and Edward Nketiah saw the Gunners extend their lead by seven points at the top of the table. On that note, it's a wrap on this edition of Gravitas Tonight, leaving you with Gravitas Images. Thanks very much for watching. to take a lot of stirs here she hasn't got right away she's done and the world's